So I, I think this is a, a very important point that you've just made, in that we do have a, a very um, unique position now in history where we have the capability to do some of the things I think that we've all been thinking of, which is to create, I guess what I'd call a health revolution. Um, we certainly need one here in the United States. And I'm just, you talked earlier about a culture of health. And I'm just wondering what you think might be ways that we in the United States can take advantage of some of the wis wisdom of traditional Indian culture to help create a health revolution here? I think one uh, fundamental thing that we, we have to fix about this wisdom business is, <laughs> wherever I go, people say ancient wisdom. No, wisdom has to be contemporary. Ancient wisdom will not work. There are some aspects of wisdom which are timeless, any time they're relevant. But many things which were very relevant a thousand years ago are not relevant today. There are certain fundamentals which are always relevant. So let's look at only that. For that, the first and foremost thing, because you're talking essentially about health, a little bit of… we have to produce a user's manual for this most sophisticated gadget that we have, a user's manual. What is the nature? How does it function? If when I… when I talk about this, see if you as much turn your hands around, the way you breathe will change. Most human beings have not noticed it. If you simply turn it around, the way you're breathing will alter itself. So this is because it is like you've been given a super sophisticated computer, but you are in still caveman's mindset, you want to beat it into action somehow. So this is the essential problem. The reason why, let's say taking United States as an example, this is not going to be the problem of only United States. United States has uh, come first in the race, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Others will get it because they're all going the same way. Right now, U.S. is a stock example. One thing is, we go on raising the bar for survival. We must define this is survival. This means you're good enough. After this, it must be exploration of what you really wish to do. But we keep on raising the bar of survival in such a way, now even after becoming the most affluent nation, a whole lot of people are just struggling for survival. This is senseless. And affluence… affluence means your survival is done thing, isn't it? But like you just mentioned, they're working three jobs to survive. This is not affluence, this is horrible poverty, at least in India we can sit back and enjoy <laughs> See, the way we have structured the society right now is, people have a thirty-five-year house mortgage. I mean, if you have a thirty-five-year economic commitment to something, tomorrow even if God popped up here, you can't change the direction of your life because the bank is here <laughs> What will you do? Because largely you're all from Christian community, so I'm saying, if Jesus popped up tomorrow and he says, come follow me, you're not going <laughs> because… Uh, no, not busy, you have to… we've got monthly payment. <laughs> you got bills to pay, <laughs> insurance to pay. You can't change. This is a silly way of organizing our lives. The question… The, the very reason why we want to become affluent is so that depending upon what life offers us, we can change the direction of our life whenever we want, isn't it? Isn't it very important? This is one thing that has to sink into the American people. Being the most affluent nation means you are not battling for survival. This is happening because you are raising the bar of survival endlessly. No matter what you do, you are still only fighting for survival. If this one thing we change, then we can do lot of things about health and well-being and beyond that. <laughs>